Ah, hey, and welcome back to Torah and Psychology. Today, one of the biggest topics in our whole tradition. Oh my gosh, it's like the crossover between Judaism and modern psychology. So to begin, I'll tell you a story that I've definitely told this story amongst other shearing that I've given, but it was really poignant. Okay, so there was one point in my life where I was seeking healers. Uh, something was going on with a family member and I wanted to do whatever part I could do in healing in order to contribute whatever I could to their healing. So I was seeking out the greats, the biggies. So I go to this guy in LA, it's like $5,000 an hour. Don't worry, I didn't pay that much. I got the hook up. Um, but like, this is like a serious real deal guy. And like, you like enter into this like fancy home down this like alleyway of like crystals and like, you go into like his office and there's like every form of God you've ever like heard of. And so immediately I'm like, you know, this goody two shoes Jewish girl, like, okay, sir, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for seeing me. But uh, I just want to let you know I'm Jewish. So like, please do not use like any of these images. Like I believe in one God and one God only. And like, so like in terms of this healing session, like it absolutely has to be in line with that, you know, cause I was getting all nervous, you know, like, oh, I don't want that like Buddha energy around me. God bless Buddhists, you know, which is like, come on, you know, like I have to do this straight with God. So um, anyhow, he does his whole session on me. And in the end, he's like, Oh, he's Australian. Okay. So he's Australian. He's like six foot six. He's got like a long white beard and like broad piercing blue eyes. <laughs> that was my accent. And he says to me at the end, he's like, you know, the problem with you Jews, the problem. And I'm like, oh no, he's anti-Semitic. I didn't know. He's like, the problem with you Jews is he stopped listening. Your Torah has one main component in it. You know what it is? It's Shmo Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. And you stop listening. That's the problem with you Jews. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> he was telling me that the reason that the Jewish people haven't been flourishing is because we lost the central art of our tradition, which is listening. And not just listening to others, but first and foremost, we only can really learn to listen to others when we've listened to ourselves, to our inner voice. So just before we even begin, like, what is an inner voice? <laughs> what is an inner voice? I asked this to my students and they were like, I don't know, like the voice of like, uh, yeah, I don't know, your intuition. I'm like, yeah, keep going. They're like, oh, the voice of your soul. I'm like, great. Okay. What's your soul? And they're like, you know, we've been learning Torah all year long, and I have no idea how to answer that. And I think a lot of people don't know how to answer that, and that's okay. Uh, according to Chabad Hasidut, your soul is a chelek eloka ma'al mamish. Literally a part of God from above as if mamish, like mamash, like for, for shizzle my nizzle dizzle, okay? Like your soul is a literal piece of God. You know, because like, listen, this thing here, this is just a sack of flesh and bones. Like I often do this exercise where I make people flap around their hand enough that it starts to feel really weird and you can like hit it a bunch of times until you realize you're just literally, I mean, try, please try it at home, right? Come on, everybody, come on, everybody, and everybody, flap your hands. <laughs> so until you realize that you're just a sack of flesh and bones. And the whole reason that we're animated, that I can communicate, that you can listen, that we can see each other, that I have energy is because I have godliness inside of me, but not just godliness. I have a piece of God, but the ultimate life force animating me. And the most amazing thing is that that doesn't just animate me. It also can guide me if I'm listening. Now, what's super cool, I learned this week um, is that there's actually different voices according to different parts of the soul. In fact, um, this one article claimed that just as we have five levels of the soul, which is, we call it Neran Chai, right? Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, and Yechira. These are the levels of the soul. They also correspond to a flame. I'll show you just now. Um, you have like the, the nefesh, which is like the like blue embery part down here. 
Ruach is like the clear part. You'll notice in like a flame, there's like a clear part just here. Neshama, right? That's like the, the brightest kind of inner part. Chaya. And then Yechida is what's called or makif. It's the surrounding light. It's the light in the candle that if you put your hands like this, there's lighter on your hands. It's, you know, like a halo, let's say. So what this one author is saying is that we have an inner voice that corresponds to all our different parts. So it says the nefesh voice, right? Of the first the lowest level of the soul, the first noon of Neran Chai, which is just an acronym, how to learn the Kabbalistic levels of soul in Judaism. The nefesh voice is concerned with my physical self, my physical world and my natural drive for survival. It urges me to take all of my physical drives and to elevate them, to refine them, and not let my animal instincts control over me. So in other words, your inner nefesh voice might be the voice that's like, sister, you got to go to the bathroom, or that voice that's like, go to bed, you know, that voice that tells us what we are like, you need food, or you should drink, speaking of which, I should drink. <laughs> uh, the ruach voice is concerned with the meditations of my heart my emotional world. It urges me to uplift my emotions and character traits. It is the voice that impels me to have deeper relationships of love and compassion. So that would be like any emotional, let's say, experience that I'm having, having tuning into my inner voice around that. The neshama voice is concerned with what goes in my mind, with what goes on in my mind. It urges me to elevate what occupies my thoughts, the content and direction of my thinking. So perhaps maybe I'm practicing overthinking or something like that, God forbid. Um, there are all these, these are, so these are like the first three basic levels of the soul. And what it's suggesting is that in terms of listening to our inner voice, there's also different aspects of our inner voice, which is pretty cool. So um, why did I get here in the first place? Why in Torah and psychology did I, did I even decide like, hey, like, listening to inner voice and the intuition and the voice of the soul, which is essentially the voice of God, that's a great idea. I should totally record an episode on that. So it comes from this particular rabbi, I believe his name was Rabbi Andy Shapiro Katz, and he was commenting on uh, the Parsha of Balak, which is where Balak, the king of Moab, hires a prophet, uh, Bil'am, to come curse the Jewish people. And on his way there, um, there's this crazy episode where he has this donkey that he's actually in a relationship with, gross, you know, and uh, he is going on the way and the donkey keeps like steering him off the side of the road and like into a, like a wall and then like, he'll, like whip the donkey and hit it and then the donkey would like smash him in the other direction and he's like so confused, this has been his donkey for three years or like, yeah, he's three years and they're like, what are you doing? Like, and then finally, 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 the donkey, Hashem makes a miracle. The donkey opens the mouth of the donkey, like Shrek or Mr. Ed. And it says, Pilam, says the donkey. Pilam, where are you seeing what I'm seeing? God sent an angel to stand in the way to block us. God doesn't want you to do this. And Pilam's like, but I have to go curse the Jews. He ends up blessing them, right? It's like, the donkey's like, no, you can't. There's an angel with the sword. He's like, but I have to, but you can't, but I have to, but you can't. So what Rabbi Andy Shapiro Katz says is, and this is where I got the inspiration from because I thought it's so profound. He says, we're not looking at two different beings here, Bilam and his donkey, the intellect and the gut. Actually, we're looking at one being, ourselves, that we can convince ourselves that the path we're on is the right path and we're doing something that's the right thing when in fact, sometimes we're not. And we forgot to check in with our inner voice. And that the only thing that communicates with us, that tells us that what we're doing is wrong, is our gut. So what this particular rabbi says is how far do each of us have to go before we will listen, like the Australian Hila was saying, you stop listening, before we listen to our gut, before we listen to that part of our character, that ethical part of us, that voice of God. How long will it be? And so I said, hey, you know what? This is a great topic just to tune into because the truth is listening is all over our Bible and our tradition. So just for an example, um, Rebetzin Chana Bracha Sigelbaum of Midrash Berot Barayin says that listening is indeed very important in the Torah. In fact, the root Shema, like Shema Israel, listen, appears 
1,216 times in the whole Tanakh and 238 times in the Chumash. It starts all the way back, act one, scene one with Adam and Eve hearing the sound of God walking in the garden in Breshit, that's Genesis 3, 8, and ends with the Israelites listening to their new leader, Yehoshua, in Devarim, or Deuteronomy 34, 9. And she just goes on and on. The examples of listening are everywhere. We learn from our father, Abraham, that listening helps us tune into our inner voice. Even before the Torah was given, it says in Breshi 26.5, that since Abraham Shama, he listened to my voice and kept my charge, that so on and so forth. Um, we, we learn also that, that Abraham, like, so where did he learn to listen from if he was never introduced to God, he didn't have a Torah. So it says, Lefi Kabbalah, according to the Kabbalah and Midrash Breshit Rabbah 95.3, that Abraham learned the entire Torah through his kidneys, which became like two pitchers of water that would overflow with Torah. The interesting thing is that we have found today in our tradition and in Chinese medicine that the hearing and the kidneys are really interconnected. Sefer Yitzira explains how the kidneys give us advice. They help us tune into our deepest truth. We can also find this in Talmud Bavli in Chulin 11a. And it says that a study, again, done in Australia on the American Journal of Kidney Diseases shows a link between chronic kidney disease and listening. And what's very interesting is that the ears resemble kidneys in shape and they reflect the condition of the kidneys. The kidney chi communicates with the ears. If the kidneys are functioning properly, the ears can distinguish these five essential sounds. And this is from Chinese medicine. So what it's essentially saying is that, okay, the kidneys are not exactly the full gut area, but it's that central area of our body, like the middle chakras that if we tune in, if we listen, are going to advise us. Um, and like really the list goes on and on and on. It says, you know, one of the most famous things that we said collectively as a people in Exodus 24-7 is, na'ase v'nishma we will do and we will hear, right? Then Moses took a record of the covenant and read it out loud to the people. Or like we've already said, the Shema itself, which comes from Deuteronomy 6.4. Or in Proverbs, the one who listens to counsel is wise. Or Isaiah, incline your ears and go to me. Listen and your souls will live. In Pirkei Avot 6.6, 6, the Torah is acquired through 48 virtues included among them is Shmiya Ta'ozen, listening. And it goes on. Um, Avot de Rabbi Natan says the eye is shown only what it is capable of seeing and the ear is given to hear only what it is capable of hearing. Um, my most favorite is every single day in our Amidah, there's this one section called Shema Koleinu. Hashem, listen to our voice, hear our voice. And that's the section in the Amidah, which is the central prayer of the whole prayer service, where we are supposed to talk to God from our heart. The interesting thing is, as Rabbi David Aaron of Yeshiva Oraita points out, lahit palel, the word for to pray, grammatically is actually self-reflexive. Lahit palel literally means to hear oneself, to have an effect on oneself, to, to be self-reflexive on the self. So, you know, a lot of times when I'm complaining to God or I'm just like in a mood, I'm like, God, why don't you hear me? How come you don't blah, blah, blah? And then I'll like, gain some maturity and I'll say, hey, Neely, why don't you hear me? Because every time I'm talking to God, essentially I am talking to the voice of my own soul. And sometimes I'm asking for God to make changes in my life when truly I'm the one that needs to be hearing the sound of my own prayers so that I know what to change in my life. Um, and even the Baal Shem Tov, the famous Baal Shem Tov, the Hasidic master says, when people listen well to the inner voice, which is within the material voice and the sound that their ears hear, they will not hear anything other than, and this is just confirmation, this is a source, the voice of God. The voice of God enlivens and brings into being that very minute the sound they hear. This comes from Hadrachot Habesh, which is at the end of Dibur Eshmuel, as quoted by Yitzhak Buxbaum in Spiritual Practices. So here we are, like, this isn't just like Neely and like, you know, 
2021 wanting to talk like spiritual stuff, the Baal Shem Tov hundreds of years ago said that we must be listening to our inner voice. Okay, so some more beautiful insights about this. And again, we could go on and on of all the different times that we listened in the Bible and we didn't listen in the Bible, right? It says that um, we had a really difficult time listening to Moshe in Shemot 6.9, because when Moshe spoke the words that we were going to get freed, we didn't listen <coughs> because of our anguish of spirit, because there was harsh labor. And this is like a lot of kind of like the advice to us is if we're so busy on the go, and if you're listening to this in America, for example, let's say we all know the like hullabaloo of daily life and like always being in a rush and like I have to go here and I have to check my phone and I have to respond to my messages and because of the anguish and the difficulty of the labor just like in Egypt right Egypt is not just a story from back when that once happened it's the paradigm for our lives we are in Egypt we are in the confines and the constrictions of the daily grind and the rat race and what unfortunately happens when we're in such anguish because of our physical labor, you know, just our jobs or taking care of our children or finances and all the million things you have to balance just to adult. We've, again, we're, we're losing the art of listening, listening, taking the time to inner, listen to our inner voice. One thing the Rebbitzin that I was quoting before recommends is she was saying that this is why Shabbat is so important. Um, but you can tune into the entire Shabbat course that will be published soon later for more episodes on why Shabbat helps us listen to our inner voice. So it's just, you know, it's really incredible. Every time I dive into one topic in Torah and psychology, I'm so blown away at how it really applies to every aspect of our life. Um, even Rabbi Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Lord, Jonathan Sachs said, may his, aliyah have neshama, may his neshama have an aliyah, that listening is not easy. He says, I confess, I find it formidably hard. But listening alone, listen how beautiful these words are, listening alone bridges the abyss between soul and soul, between self and other. Listening alone bridges the abyss between soul and soul, between self and other. I am the divine. It says the Jewish spirituality is the art of listening. So I want to just take a moment and um, read a little passage from The Pleasure of Peace by Hannah Rachel Furman in her chapter two, which is the section on listening. And she calls this section focused listening versus filtered listening. And it is, this is a book, she's a therapist who helps couples stop and relearn to listen to each other. But in this particular section, so, so I'll, I'll explain why that's relevant to listening to our inner voice. The act we call listening is most often not pure listening. And what I mean to say is we can apply this both in relationship, but primarily my main address of this particular episode is listening to self. That act we call listening is most not often pure listening. Rather, it's a process of filtering what we hear. We're bringing in some of what's being spoken and discarding the rest. This is not real listening. So again, if the way that you're listening to yourself is like, blah, 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 okay, okay, that process that. No, 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 don't think about that. This isn't real listening. Real listening is the process of creating a space of acceptance and non-judgment in order to welcome another person's thinking and culture. I'll read that again. Real listening is the process of creating a space of acceptance and non-judgment in order to welcome another person's thinking and culture. So here's, here's the deal, yo. I find, and I've consulted with many other therapists, that when we struggle with listening to our inner voice, we struggle for two reasons primarily. One, like we said already, because of the anguish and the hard work, Kotzeruach of Egypt, right? We're too busy to even stop and tune in. And that's also why a lot of people today really love yoga or meditation practices or plant medicine because it's just an excuse to sit there, right? We always say in, in the Western world, it's don't just sit there, do something. But in Judaism, it's don't just do something, sit there and hear. So that's the primary reason we struggle. 
But then the secondary reason we struggle to listen to our inner voice is because sometimes we don't like what it has to say, right? Maybe you're dating someone and the inner voice is like, this isn't good, right? But like, we don't want to listen. We don't want to listen. Like, we'd rather just like not listen to the inner voice. It's going to make us do something we don't want to do. But everybody knows. Everybody knows. We pay the price after. Or for example, there is a party or a gathering or an alumni reunion or even synagogue and you're just feeling social or lonely and you just want to go or someone's birthday party, but there's a voice in you saying, just put on your pajamas and get in bed, right? We don't want to listen because a lot of times our personal ego agenda, because we want to be seen or we want to be which is not so egoy. Let's we, we want to be seen, you know. That's okay. Um, it will get in the way, and I, I truly believe that part of this concept of why listening in Judaism is so important is because it teaches us to align ourselves rather than with ego with truth. And so what Hanor Chalfruman is saying is that real listening is the process of creating a space of acceptance and non-judgment in order to welcome another person's thinking and culture or to welcome your own thinking and culture without acceptance and without judgment. You know, I've done ceremonies personally where I was doing personal work and I heard voices in my head that were telling me things I was really surprised to hear. Like that person is not right for you. That person is good for you. And I was like, what? And the more I tuned in, I had just been repressing those thoughts. I just didn't want to hear them, but I knew it was true. And even just beginning with the process of listening to our inner voice, maybe I don't have the courage yet. Maybe I don't have the courage yet to act on it, but at least I'll begin aligning myself with the truth. Because listen, I'll tell you what I've found in my 37 years. The more that I go with what my inner voice, what the voice of God within me says, the easier the path is. And the more that I deny it, repress it, ignore it, don't want to listen to it, I can take other options and I have made other options. <laughs> In fact, I even moved to the city I live now against my inner voice and it's been a difficult year because at the, when I was deciding to move here or not, a voice said to me, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And I was like, okay, I'm doing it. <laughs> well, I know I paid the price and I know I can hear now my inner voice why, it, you know, I, okay, I had to do it and everything is perfect. But I understand why it made the path more difficult because my inner voice was shouting against it as I was in the decision process. So she says, um, we've been trained to listen in a busy way. Sometimes we're taught that always being mentally occupied is a sign of intelligence. So we are intelligently listening by busily filtering everything we hear. Again, this is self with self and other. However, there's an entirely different practice that not only uses intelligence, but also sensitivity and compassion. It's called focused listening. It offers the speaker a sense of being valued and of belonging in this world. And again, that's lovely. And if you can master being an incredible listener for others, that's epic. But truly, we're trying to learn to master to be first and foremost an incredible listener for ourselves. So just the same way as you can do exercises in terms of sitting with a partner and echoing what they have to say and repeating and asking them, did I understand what you said? We can actually practice this with ourselves, And there's amazing listening exercises online that you can discover yourself. So that's one aspect that I wanted to bring up. Now, the next aspect that I want to bring up in terms of learning how to listen to our intuitive voice as we learn from Balak, uh, from Parshat Balak, from Bilam and the donkey, that when we have an argument, it's not necessarily between myself and other, it's usually within myself and myself. So how do I tell? So I'm going to give three techniques. One that we learn from Abraham and Yitzchak, and two that are just modern versions of muscle testing that help train ourselves into listening. So I learned this out from Rabbi David Sachs in LA, and it is from um, the Parsha in the Bible where Abraham has to go take his son, his only son, Isaac, the one he loves, and sacrifice him. Ah, 
no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. You know, can you imagine Abraham Avinu, who's just preached to the whole wide world, don't sacrifice your son, has a godly voice that comes to him and says, sacrifice your son. So this initial exercise is how to distinguish between the voices in our mind that are not friendly, that are not the inner voice, that are the voice of Sheker or the Satan or the other side or the dark side and the godly voice. Because again, how, how do I know what to do? Like I've already stopped and listened. That was amazing. Woohoo! But then I don't like what my inner voice is telling me. So if I don't like what it's telling me, like what I did when I moved to this particular city that didn't work out so well, um, I refuse to listen. I paid the price. But <laughs> how do I how do I know, right? If that voice is telling me something I don't feel like I want to do, is that the godly voice or is it a voice from the other side? Or if it's telling me something I do want to do, is it just my ego and I'm so happy that my inner voice uh, echoes it? Or like, is it legit? How do I know? How do I know what the voices in my head are telling me, right? And this relates to the inner critic. And if you watch that episode, you'll re-remember this teaching. The words in the Bible are, Kach na et bincha. Please take your son. Please take your son. So we don't need that word na, please. God is not like, go into like formality school or whatever you call it. And please fold the napkin this way and say please and thank you. No. But if we didn't need that, please, it's there for a reason. And Rabbi David Sachs says it's there to teach us that the voice of God will be pleasant in our ears. It will encourage us. It will be sweet. Come on, sweetie, get out of bed, honey. Oh, come on, honey, you could stay home. You just get into your pajamas, right? They're like, okay, like, I think you could work out. You could do this. Or, um, mm, yeah, please don't say that out loud, right? When the voice is kind, then we can have more insight into trusting that this is a godly voice. When the voice is cruel or nudging or nagging or mean to us, get up already. That is not necessarily the inner voice. And we can begin to learn to separate out the voices within our inner voice. So that's one. And that's one technique is just listening. Is this voice kind? Because if my inner voice is the voice of my soul, and if the voice of my soul is the voice of God, then I need to be careful. Is this the voice of God or is this the voice of my ego? And again, so that's the beginning of distinguishing. Two muscle tests. The first one begins with standing up. Okay, so this is how to just train yourself into beginning to understand your inner voice. So you wanna stand sideways and you wanna start asking yourself obvious questions. And you can begin with, my name is, okay? So if the answer is true, or desirable, you'll lean slightly forward. And if it is not true or desirable, you'll lean slightly back. So my name is Neely. And I'll just feel my body floating forward. Okay, here's a not truism. I love snakes. Oh gosh, my body just went back. And it's not like I'm like dining, but like the body reacts, okay? I really want some bubbly water. I'm really thirsty right now, you know? So my body goes forward. Um, I would love to eat a pack of salt. The body goes back. And then when I train my body into the forward sway or the backward sway, then I can begin asking myself difficult situations. So let's say I need to figure out if I should pack or sublet. Should I pack? My body goes forward. That means probably that I'm leaning towards it. It's the same reaction as if you were attracted to somebody at a Shabbos meal. And when they're talking, you'll find yourself kind of leaning in or not even just attracted. If someone's interesting or captivating, you find yourself leaning in. Whereas if someone is saying something annoying, you're going to find yourself in your chair leaning back like this because the body really reacts. Our muscles are, in, they are in sync with and animated by our inner voice. So we can use muscle testing. Again, you always have to be careful to distinguish between the ego, but these are just quick tips of how to begin, right? As I've said multiple times, these episodes are diving boards, right? These episodes are an opportunity every week to examine one aspect of Torah and psychology. And because psychology is huge, especially today, about listening to your inner voice, I wanted to source it in Torah. Exercise number two, I call this the thigh test. Um, so I learned this from my friend, Yochavid Rindenau. So basically, it's the same practice as the leaning, you want to put your thigh up or just you want to put your hand on your thigh and then you want to just 
push slightly forward if it's a yes and slightly back if it's a no. Um, so uh, you start you start by practicing the word yes, okay? So you'll just train your hand, yes, yes. You don't have to like shove it all the way to China, but just yes, yes, against that forward motion, yes, yes. And then you wanna train backwards, no, 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 no. And you wanna kind of pull back. And then you do the same question process, right? Um, am I tired? Oh, my hand went forward a little bit. Um, uh, do I want to eat chicken? No, I'm a vegetarian. Um, uh, and then, and then any difficult question, should I be spending more time with uh, a friend? And in my head, I'm thinking of a friend that I happen to like, and my hand goes forward. Uh, now think of a friend you don't like, should I spend more time with that friend? And the hand goes backwards. And you sort of start to, you know, it might be very subtle, but if you pay close attention, you'll find that your body really can help you tune in and listen to your inner voice. Because again, we said that your inner voice, the voice of your intuition, is the voice of your soul. And your soul is what animates the body. Without a soul, my body is limp. So the body and the soul really can work together to help us tune in to our inner voice. So, wow. You know, I love this series again because it's so simple and yet so deep. So I want to bring two more sources for us to finish off this episode. Uh, the first one is the idea from Mayan Waldman, who says that, you know, if you think about all the times we're instructed to tune in and listen in, one of the most poignant ones is Happy New Year, Rosh Hashanah. It says in the Rosh Hashanah service, we, we recite, Ashrei ha'am she'odea tru'ah. Happy is the people that knows the blast of the shofar. Our ultimate happiness, this verse seems to indicate, is contingent upon our ability to open our ears to the voices of others, the voice of ourselves, and the voice of God. She has this adorable passage. It says, philosopher Rene Descartes famously stated, I think, therefore I am, but... The shofar teaches us that the ultimate Jewish attitude is not one of philosophical thought or eloquence or even action, but rather of listening. So she rephrases it as, I listen, therefore I am. And the truth is, when you're at Rosh Hashanah, when you're at New Year's and you hear the call of the shofar, the sages say within Kabbalah and Hasidut, that this is the voice of your soul. This is the cry of your own soul. And one of the meditations that you can apply during the Rosh Hashanah service is as the chazan is blowing the shofar, you want to listen in to that voice inside of you without, like Hanach was saying, without any expectations or judgments, without, you know, expecting that the voice you're going to hear, you're going to like what it has to say or not. It's just open, non-judgmental acceptance and listening and regaining that art of the Shema Yisrael, of tuning in and listening in. And even if this is a practice you just take on simply with, um, what should I eat? I don't know what to eat. Listen in. Sometimes I want to ask, I, I dress by color. I don't know if you could tell. So I'll ask myself, okay, Neely, what color is today? And I listen in. Sometimes when I'm walking to a certain place, should I go this way or should I go that way? I listen in. The other day, um, I needed to go make a copy of my key and I was on the way to do it. And a voice inside of me just said, go home and do that later. And then the most miraculous thing, I ran into somebody that I, would never have run into because I, I was going to go that way. And I literally turned back around just because the voice inside of me said, mm -mm, Neely, go the other way. So these examples, even if we just practice them at any point in our day, it starts to get us more in tune with the listening inside. Then we can follow the own advice of our kidneys and others. Uh, and again, I listen, therefore I am. The, it's essential to our role as a Jew and somebody who is in touch with themselves. Um, finally, uh, a favorite quote that people just love and touches many hearts comes from Melachim Aleph, that's Kings 1, chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. And he said, 
Go out and stand in the mountain before the Lord. Behold, the Lord passes and a great and strong wind splitting the mountains and shattering boulders before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And then after the wind, an earthquake, an earthquake hit. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake hit, there was fire, a great fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, kol dmama daka, a still small voice, a still small sound was heard. And it was in that voice that Elijah the prophet could hear the voice of God. So it's like, you know, when we want to tune into our inner voice, we don't need loud, magnificent counsel and, you know, like talking to all our friends about it and like, you know, getting dramatic. We need to get quiet. And it is in that still small voice that we will hear the voice of God, that we'll hear ourselves. And that tuning into our intuition is one of the best ways that we can follow the pathways of Hashem, of that part of God, which manifests specifically through me in this world. Um, I was working with a healer this week and she said something amazing. She said, you know, whoever you are, whatever you do, whatever you hear, that is because God wanted an experience through you of this world. So listening into our inner voice is imperative because we're supposed to be the most ourselves as possible not just because that's great for your you know, emotional integrity and becoming who you are and truly belonging, but because that's how you give God back that experience that he so desires of experiencing the world through you and listening to the world through you and your soul. On that note, I wanna blow the shofar so that we can tune in and hear the sound of our inner voice. And this can be your first practice. When you listen in, what do you hear? without judgment, without criticism, without expectation. Now, a lot of times when I blow the shofar on recording, it does an interesting mute situation, which will be cool because then it will get even quieter and we'll be able to hear it. So let's do this. Let's try as the beginning exercise to listen into the voice of our souls. We also learned today about whether or not the voice is kind in our mind. We learned about the leaning exercise and the thigh exercise, so much to consider. And on this, you can also practice hearing your inner voice by the sound of the shofar. <laughs> Did you hear the voice of your soul? I hope so. And I hope that this is the beginning of a new thought on what would my life be like more if I did tune in to my inner, my inner voice, my intuition, that voice of God within me. Thank you so much for listening and see you next time on Torah in Psychology. Peace in, my dear friends. Peace in. You like that? Get it? Peace in instead of peace out. <laughs> Bye.